Exactly. We're talking to Sam Dunn and Scott McFadden, co-directors of Flight 666. Most important question first, gentlemen, how many Iron Maiden shirts do you own between the two of you? I've got one. <laughs> oh! Actually, the only Maiden shirt I kept was the, the video shirts they, kept, they, they made for this one tour. So all of my Maiden shirts are, are in tatters and haven't survived the test of time. So. Fair enough, yeah. fair enough. I have a few, but I feel, I feel kind of ridiculous wearing it. It's a bit spit over the top. <laughs> Well, the most, most interesting thing I found was when EMI pitched me on doing this as a cover, and this is the cover of our April-May issue, I wasn't sure because I thought, well, Iron Maiden is, their heyday was in the 80s. But then I realized, having gone to their show at the ACC that you filmed, that half the crowd is 24 and under, and if they're, if they're older people, it's you know, parents bringing their kids a lot of the time. Well, how do you, what do you ascribe um, Iron Maiden's multi-generational appeal to? Why, did, why does everyone from all ages love this band so much? Well, I mean, I, I brought my 13-year-old niece to the show, uh, and it was her first sort of big concert, and, uh, and she was blown away. I think the live experience is something that, that, that no matter how old you are, you still get a rush out of it. But if someone's good at doing it, putting on a big show. But I, I think in terms of how people find out about it, how young people find it, you know, it's like, it's a, it's a word of mouth thing, you know. I think people are getting into newer metal bands or rock bands, and 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 they always read that they're paying tribute to some of the people that the, that these bands were influenced by, or even their parents. So we see a lot of parents bringing their kids to the mm-hmm. show, so they hear it at home, they get into it, and and, and uh, they come to the shows. Okay. And how did your you know your approach to Maiden, or actually how how you actually thought of the band, change from before you knew them to now, having spent how many you know days actually filming the band and you know spending the time in the editing bay and whatnot, going from fan to actually being inside the machine. I, well, I guess for me, because I grew up listening to Maiden as a young, much younger person, uh, it was transition from recognizing that they're good musicians to recognizing that they're good people, mm. and that that's the reason for their success over the long term isn't just because they make great songs, but because they have an operation there that is very solid, and it's a family, and uh, that 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 they haven't really ever compromised their way of doing things, and I think that's a that's why they've they've endured for so long, for sure. Now, obviously, Maiden was a part of Global Metal, your last effort as well. Um, how did, was there any relationship between that film and this film? Did this film spring out of Global Metal? Well, it's kind of weird that we ended our last film in India with Iron Maiden, and we started this film in India with Iron Maiden. Was it there. the same show? It wasn't the same show. Oh, okay. No. And we ended our first film in Germany and started our second film in Germany. So and we're ending this film in Toronto and starting with Rush in Toronto. That's just coincidence. <laughs> but no, I think uh, it was definitely because, I mean, our, uh, Rod Smallwood, the manager, uh, after seeing our first film, Metal Headbangers Journey, he phoned us up and he said, you know, that's the best thing that's ever been done about heavy metal. And he appreciated that the approach that we took, that we were the first to look at heavy metal in a kind of, you know, an intelligent way and not making fun of it like Spinal Tap or, you know, Wayne's World. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, so that was certainly how we built the trust with them. And then when we approached Rod about doing a doc on um, them specifically, um, he said it was that was a good idea. So uh, it was a slow build of trust with them. If we tried to come in cold and ask them, I, we never, they never would have allowed it. So. And our writer Sophie, when she did the interview, she was saying that, well, actually, one of the quotes from the band, I think from actually Rod Smallwood as well, was saying that the band has survived not because they're fashionable, but because they have their own style, and certainly, you know, the band has survived by doing their own thing over course of however many years. Is that the sort of thing that appealed to you right away as fans of the band, especially, I guess, Sam yourself, you know, knowing them from such a small, you know, from a young age, knowing that maybe this band isn't quite like Poison, but maybe they've lasted a little bit longer, maybe they have a little bit more integrity than Rock of Love Bus might have. Yeah, no, you couldn't make a Rock of Love about Iron Maiden. <laughs> I mean, they're a completely different thing. I think Kevin Shirley, Iron Maiden's producer, and, you know, in the film, he really nails it on the head when he says, you know, what's made Iron Maiden relevant after all these years is they've never cared about being relevant. And that they've always done 
their own thing because they were never really part of the mass media. They never had got radio play. They had videos, but they never relied on videos for for their for their popularity. They 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 built their fan base through being a great live band and and also touring to places in the world that. Back in the 80s, when Maiden went to, to Brazil, you know, not a lot of bands were going to Brazil. Yeah. And nobody was going to Poland in 1984. Right. And I think that what we're seeing now is sort of the, the reverberations of the, those, those earlier tours to those parts of the world. And it's amazing that Maiden is more popular now than they were in their heyday. It is crazy. I mean, I think they're as surprised as anyone else. Yeah. I think a lot of people... Uh, the average person you talk to and you tell them that Iron Maiden's coming to town, and they're like, oh, Iron Maiden's still still around, and then they they would be amazed to find out that it sold out a stadium or it sold out you know, seventy thousand people in Sao Paulo. So, um, I mean, I think they are su- as surprised as anyone that this word of mouth and, as we say, the integrity of s- sticking to your guns and doing what you do has sort of come full circle, and people mm-hmm. people are you know. There's young people, it's like 15 year olds. Yeah, life. exactly. And I'll finish off. Tell me a little bit about your, your next project. You're working on a documentary about Rush. Tell us a bit yeah. about that. <laughs> if you can. Yeah. If you well, can. Yeah, well, we can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I mean, our next film is about Rush, uh, Canada's biggest rock band. Mm-hmm. And it's a very different film than Flight 666. It's a, it's a film about the history and the influence of Rush and how we might argue that they're the biggest cult band in the world. Mm-hmm. You know, kind of similarly to, to Maiden, they, they built a fan base through, through you know, through this, this passion that the people have for the music and, and kind of always doing their own thing. So we've got interviews with people who you'd never expect were, were Rush fans, from mm. Trent Reznor to Billy Corgan, yeah. the guys in Tool, Foo Fighters, and a lot of other artists. So. Um, we're, we're, we're up to here and editing footage right now, so we don't expect it to be released until early to mid next year. Excellent. Well, Sam Scott, thank you very much, and good luck with Flight 666. Cheers. All right. Thank you. Up the irons. Up the irons.